Good morning. You guys stand and sing with us. You guys can have a seat real quick. I want to say a quick word of welcome. Welcome to the Vine at Clemson United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you are here. It feels like it's been a month since we've been together. That's not true, but it feels like that with a snow day and different things in between. But welcome back. If this is your first time here, we're especially glad that you're here. If you've been with us since the beginning, welcome back again. We wouldn't be who we are without you. A few announcements as we get started. Um, one, hopefully you grabbed one of these, or maybe your neighbor does at some point in time. Uh, there's several announcements on the back page of this bulletin. Uh, that's what it's there for. There's also that QR code that we've been filling, using since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, at some point in time, if you will scan that, uh, there's also the link to go to Linktree there. You'll let us know that you're here. There's also a place, uh, if you scan that QR code, let's slow down for a second, it will send you to this link with all these different things you can click on. Um, one of them being, um, hey, I'm here. Another being, um, hey, I have a prayer request. Can the prayer team please pray for this? Um, there's information on how to sign up for children's and youth ministry. If you're in college and you're like, hey, there's this awesome college ministry called Clemson Wesley here. How do I get involved? That'll send you to that page as well. A lot of stuff is there, so be sure to check that out um, as well as the other announcements that are here. A lot of things kicking back up today. Right after service, we have our tweens group meeting. That is third through fifth graders. They'll meet here 
from 11.30 to about 1 o'clock. It's a great fun time, so if you're in that group, be sure to stick around. Our youth group is back meeting again tonight at 5 p.m. I hear they have like chicken Alfredo and some kind of awesome meal, so be sure that you are here for that if you are in 6th through 12th grade. And then Clemson Wesley is coming back tonight as well. Our Wesley worship will get back started right here at 6.30, and I heard your pie is catering pasta, so be sure here, you're here for that as well. Um, if you want to come anyway, come on. If you're not in college, come on. We'll have a good time. 6.30 right here in this space. It'll be good. Um, two more announcements. Um, one, uh, Beth Yoder's in the back. Stand up, Beth. There's Beth Yoder in the back. Beth will be going around. Please don't run out to service. Um, we have a lot of different things that make this service run, and so it's a kind of a new year, and so we're looking for some folks to help set up in the morning, help greet, help serve communion, that sort of stuff, and so if that's ever been on your heart, um, see Beth afterwards. If it's not on your heart, Beth will see you and make sure it gets on your heart. So just be sure to, you know, think through what it is that you might want to do here in this service. And then lastly, uh, before we light our community candle, our, we had a growth in our community over the weekend. We were very excited. We've got a, a rose on the altar. Carol Ackerman has been a longtime member here, and she had a new great-granddaughter, um, Zach and Carrie Rita, who recently joined the Vine, who've been worshiping here forever as well, um, had baby Caroline on Friday. Um, she's beautiful, uh, mom, dad, everyone is doing well. I got to talk with them yesterday, and so we're excited to welcome them uh, into the community. We're going to figure out, I uh, know we do some things for folks who have um, new infants, and so we're going to make sure they're taken care of, but as you see them, um, you know, be sure to give them some love, and, and we just welcome them as our, our CMC family continues to grow. We're excited, and we celebrate the birth of Caroline this morning. We're going to continue, before we continue in singing, we're going to light this community candle. And if you're new to us, we light like this every week. If you've been here since the beginning or been here for a while, I hope that it brings you something special as we light this, right? We light this each and every week, and it's a symbol for us. One, one it reminds us that we are here to gather around the light of Christ. There's, it's a symbol for us that we gather together as a true community, that we celebrate the joys of life. We come together, and we, we, we hug each other, and we cry during the sorrows of life. But however it is that you come into this space, whether you are on fire, whether you're trying to put one foot in front of the other, however you come, we come together as one, to sing with each other, to sing for each other, to come together and worship the God who has created each and every one of you, who has redeemed us all, and who promises to sustain us all. And it's in that spirit that I invite you to stand as we continue in worship together. Praise the hallelujah. Presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. to fight for me.
pray with me. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your son, the, the son that is here today. We thank you for the beauty of the snow that we've seen, the laughter of the children. We thank you for the peace that, uh, that we have seen this week, maybe, and for those that are struggling to find that, Lord, we ask that you will just cover them. We pray for joy. We thank you for those moments that we find it. We thank you for the struggles that make those that moments of joy even more profound and special. Lord, we just uh, thank you today for your love, that in every way you love us, that you remain unchanged. As we see in your creation that teaches us change over and over and seasons over and over, that you are consistent, that change is consistent, but you show us your love unconditionally.
Oh, I know you're awake. Let's try it again. Good morning. I'd like to invite all of our children that would like to go to Vine Kids, if you will go ahead and get up. And Miss Candace is in the back, and she's got a great lesson prepared for you guys today. And I just have to say, I was a happy girl last week with all that snow. I, I tend to tell the kids to do a whole lot of traditions, and I do them too. So I was flushing ice cubes down the toilet. There's a white crayon in my fridge. My PJs were on inside out and backwards, and I did a snow dance, and it worked. And there's a chance for this weekend, so guess what? I'm dancing again. <laughs> Love some snow. Let's go to God in prayer. Eternal God, you are the maker of all of us, and we are your creation. People formed in your image as individuals, as community, formed and fed and transformed because of who you are and whose we are. We worship you today because you invite us to share in your creative and healing work. We are here because we have heard you speak in us and through us. Help us, dear Lord, to ever respond to you and your invitation to your grace. God, of all of our moments, of our days and our nights, you speak and act in the world around us, not only to call all people to you, but also to direct and guide us in the way of healing and wholeness. Awaken us, Lord, to hear what you would say to us. Help us to open our ears, our eyes, and our hearts to your presence. Help us to know when it is your voice we are hearing and not just our own desires. We pray that your church may rise up with renewed commitment to answer your call, that your people may be instruments of your grace and love. We pray for those who consider themselves inadequate and dismiss or avoid your calling in their lives. Give them a new vision, a vision in which you are their strength and their hope. We pray for those who, in answering your call, must leave the known for the unknown, the comfortable for the uncertain. Grant them courage and steadfast love. We pray too today, O oh Lord, for those in want and need, for those of us and of the larger community who suffer in body and in soul. Loving Father, bless all of us with abundant faith, a fruitful ministry, a joyful life. Bless us and all those who gather together to continue the work of Jesus, who came to heal, save, and deliver us all. Amen. Our scripture lesson for today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 11 through 14. These things happened to them to serve as an example, and they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my friends, flee from the worship of idols. Within our words, an unseen power is set in motion. The tongue is a small thing, but like a tiny spark can set a great force on fire. Once spoken, our words begin blazing and trail through the hearts and lives of those around us. One kind word can demolish guilt. It can inspire hope. But the same words have also embraced hatred and executed innocence. Once spoken, our words scorch their feelings and emotions on a level that only they can produce. Your words set up a chain of events beyond your control and of which you will never know. One word can destroy beliefs, harden hearts, or cultivate hatred. But they can also demonstrate faith display forgiveness, and nurture love. The power of life and death lies in a single word, and we, the image of God, have this power in one word. We, um, there we go. We started a series um, called the Words Matter, and we began to look at some of the half-truths and other things that Christians say. And a couple weeks ago, we began looking at something that maybe you have said or have heard, maybe has comforted you or think was comforting. And we talked about the phrase, um, everything happens for a reason. 
And we began to look at that and the theology behind our words and say how, you know, sometimes we, it might be good to say, but when you really get down and drill down into it, um, it can really say that, that God causes a lot of things to happen that we really don't want to think and believe that God causes to happen. And so we sort of talked about, I, I talked about how I would like for us to sort of scratch that from our vocabulary, especially when we're trying to comfort folks, because it, believe it or not, actually leads to some, some rough things. Uh, if you're curious, you can go back and watch that. It's on Facebook. But um, this week, we're going to be looking at, um, at sort of its cousin uh, phrase in just a moment. And, um, and the reason we're looking at this is we're sort of spending some time these next several weeks looking at our theology of our words, or what do the words really mean? A lot of these are phrases that are common terms in, in our sort of Christian lingo, but when we really lay them out and, and sort of systematically look at how far they go and what happens, it's sort of like those dominoes in the video that we just watched, right? We think we're saying something that's, that's unharmful, something that's helpful, and before we know a few dominoes later, we may, may actually be hurting our neighbor as we say things that we think are, are helpful. This week, um, one that I know I have, I have said and I have heard as well, you perhaps are familiar with this, um, the phrase, God won't give you more than you can handle. Have you ever said that or heard that? Maybe you say, you know, that brings me comfort. Maybe you're like, Steve, get, yeah, get, the, get out of here with this, right? We don't, we don't want this, right? And I mentioned earlier in the first week that it's okay to disagree, right? That's, that happens here in the church from time to time, and that's probably a healthy thing. But today we're going to look at God, looking at the half-truth, God won't give you more than you can handle. Now, commonly it's used, right, when you're going through hard times, uh, you're trying to, trying to help someone, they've got a lot going on in their life, they're struggling, they're, you know, trying to put one foot in front of the other, and you're like, it's, it's okay. God won't give you more than you can handle. You can do it. You can handle it. And perhaps at times it is comforting. I know it's been told to me at times in life, I'm like, well, good, God's got my back, I'm good, I can handle this, right? But when we dig down into it, we're going to see that it can be problematic, and by the end I want us to look at a different phrase that perhaps is more helpful than saying God won't give you more than you can handle. We get this phrase from, it, sort of its origin comes from the text that Miss Amanda read for us a little while ago, our 1 Corinthians chapter 10. But when we use the phrase, God won't give you more than you can handle, oftentimes we use it, again, saying the hardships that you're going through, the hard times in life. But the text that uh, Miss Amanda read was not about hardships in life, instead it was about temptation. And Paul was writing to the, to the church in Corinth about avoiding temptation, not avoiding hardships and, and different stresses in life, but instead avoiding temptation. The word that Paul used there um, for um, test in our, in our translation, but in a lot of other translations, it's um, translated as, as tempted or temptation that is there, right? In the context surrounding this, um, these were people growing up in Corinth. Corinth was a port city. The more I learned about Corinth, the more it sort of reminds me of New Orleans. Um, there were a lot of different influences that were taking place in Corinth. There was a pagan temple on every street corner. You could get into all kind of bad things you wanted to get to in Corinth. That was just a place to do, right? Think Bourbon Street. That's where you're at in Corinth sometimes, right? Um, there were temple prostitution was a thing that happened all the time. It was normal, uh, practicing idolatry, um, different sacrifices. And so Paul was talking to these newly converted Christians who had grown up living this lifestyle and said, be careful. Don't fall into the temptation, right? If you went to the meat market in Corinth, there was a good chance that the meat you were buying was used as an animal sacrifice at one of the temples, right? And so he was saying, avoid the idolatry. Avoid worshiping these other gods that you used to worship. I know you used to go visit the, temp visit the temple prostitutes, but we're not going to do that anymore as so we try to follow Christ, right? And so he's saying, avoid the temptation of idolatry and sexual immorality. That's sort of the point of what he's getting at here in 1 Corinthians 10. And it's not unique to the Corinthians. He uses the first few verses before what Miss Amanda read. Um, he was talking about um, the Israelites as they were walking and wandering and saying how they fell into idolatry. And they fell into sexual immorality. And he was saying, look, they had issues too. God gave them a way out of it, but they struggled with temptation as well. You've heard these things. That's where we picked up. You've heard these things. But be careful while you're standing that you don't fall and that you don't fall into temptation. Ancient Israelites struggled. The church of Corinth struggled. I'm not going to make you raise your hand, but if we're honest with ourselves, we also struggle with temptation from time to time. But what we see here is Paul reminding them that God will provide them a way out of that, out of that temptation, right? It's a reminder that temptation is not about hardships that we're talking here, but temptation is about a test of our character. It's about a test of our resolve and a test of our faith, right? Or tempting that stuff, not, not necessarily about hardships, right? Let's talk about temptation for a second, just so we can kind of get through this, this part, and then we'll talk about um, God won't give you more than you can handle, right? 
If you've been through, you know, live more than like five minutes, you know that temptation is out there, right? It happens all the time. Um, some stuff is serious temptation. Some is, is a little bit lighter. Um, I work downtown. My office is at the Clemson Wesley um, building, the student center we have downtown. It's behind the little police substation. We call it the church in the alley, right? You go to the alley, you'll find our building, right? And my office, you know, I'm like here. And then about the edge of the stage are all these snacks that I buy solely for the students, right? And so, you know, this week I'm working on this sermon and getting ready and thinking through temptation. And I'm like, yeah, temptation, you got to avoid temptation. I'm like, ooh, I've got some Oreos over there, right? And so I get up and I walk and I'm like, no, I don't know. I don't need Oreos. Like, I got to slim down. No, no, right? If you, if you had, we don't have cameras in there, but you would have seen me five times going back and forth and be like, no, God can do it, right? Let me tell you. Two packs of Oreos, a nut of butter, then cheeses later, right? Temptation won that day, right? And it was good, right? But we struggle with those temptations, right? And God provides us with a way out, but oftentimes we give in to that. We say, you know, you probably made New Year's resolutions. Oh, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to do this, right? But, oh, man, but the Papa John's on a Friday night, mm, so much better than a kale salad and some grilled chicken, right? And so we give in to some of these temptations from time to time. But we see in James 1, 3, we see God is, is not tempted by any, e- any form of evil, nor does he tempt anyone, We see in the Lord's Prayer, oftentimes we say, right, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And our prayer there is not that God would lead us into temptation ordinarily, but we're praying week in and week out, God, help us avoid the temptation. Lead us away. Lead us away from the bad things. Lead us into the goodness that you have provided for us. We see throughout Scripture in the 1 Corinthians 10 passage over and over that God provides a way out of the temptation. Over and over again, he provides us ways out of it. We could, you know, I could quit buying those snacks for the students, and I wouldn't be there, right? But oftentimes, we give in to that anyway. But it's never God that provides that temptation. And it's never God that provides that temptation that's too much for that, right? We have the power to resist. It's difficult sometimes, but we have the power to resist. I'm sorry, but the excuse like the devil made me do it, or I just couldn't help myself, no, nah, doesn't cut it, right? We just gave in to temptation. So that's there, that's, that's there, we want to avoid that. But going back to our, our, our message this morning, looking at God won't give you more than you can handle, I want to sort of drill down on that uh, for just a moment. And where this half-truth misses the mark, right, when we say this, is that it's, it's really not fully true, right? And I'll be honest, I used to believe this. I used to live by this. I'm a person that likes to fix it. I'm a person that likes to do it. No was really not in my vocabulary for the longest of time. If something needed to be done, yes, I'll do it, right? And I got to tell you, I, I got to a point, uh, February, end of February 2020 was one of the lowest points of my life. I had tons of responsibility, had tons of stress. Everything just kept weighing down, weighing down, weighing down, weighing down. God won't give me more than I can handle. Well, God, you sure are crushing me with a whole lot of stuff right now. And it got to a point where I finally broke. It snapped me. I'm going to put one more straw in this camel's back broken half. And I remember having to reach out to friends. I had to go see my doctor. And I said, look, I, you know me for a long time, and this isn't me. I, I don't know what to do. I cannot take, I've really, I physically am tr- struggling to take one more step. And eventually I went, and I, I had to go, and I, I saw a, a counselor, and he helped me work through some things and reprioritize my life, helped me work through some stress. And I got into a point where I had more on my plate than I could handle. And I remember talking to my therapist and saying, what is the deal with it? Like, and first of all, who goes to therapy, right? I had to, right? And I realized, and he's like laughing, I'm not laughing at me, right? But he's like, that's why we're here. You're not alone. My office isn't just for you. I have appointments before you and after you. Many, many people have more than they can handle. This myth, right? And we keep t- I talk, talk about being a pastor and talking about this. He's like, that's, that's, that's a myth. I see people all the time who have more on their plate than they can handle. And so I want you to hear this morning that hardships are going to happen, right? And if you feel like you've got more on your plate than you can handle, there's more in your life than you can handle, then that's probably true. And it's time to reach out and find some help, find some people that can help you manage that, take stuff off your plate, help you work through the hardships that are weighing you down. Here's some of the issues, one of the big issues I have with this idea that, that God won't give you more than you can handle. And it's the first four words that really um, grind my gear, so to speak. God won't give you, right? If we believe that or we say that, we, we say this full thing, then what we're implying here is that God gives us those hardships, right? Mm-hmm. And that if God gives us, won't give us more than we can handle, that means God is sitting there, right, and we're just trying to hold these boxes, and God's just putting box, 
after box after box, right? And we're like, I right, got, I can't do it. He's like, come on, suck it up, right? One more, one more. And God's just pressing us down and pressing us down and pressing us down. And he's like, ah, he's about to snap. All right, stop, right? And we're left walking like this. We're left holding all the hardships, all the tough things. And we feel like we're in an endless squat. I can't believe I haven't passed out yet, right? But that's where, we, that's where, we're, where we're at. If we believe this and we press this, is that we're saying that we follow a God, we believe a God that's just going to continue to press down on us and press down on us and press down on us until right till we get to that tipping point. He's like, all right, you're good. Stay down there. I don't know about you, but that's not a God I want to follow. A God that's going to give us hardship after hardship just up until the point where we're going to not break. That's not a life. That's not a God that brings us life and life abundant, that comes and, and, and brings us the, 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 the source of all of our joy and peace. And that ties back in what we talked about two weeks ago, the problem with everything happens for a reason. We say, yes, there's this world of cause and effect, but oftentimes we use that as a way to say that everything happens according to God's will. And we said that if we follow that, right, then that means all the bad things that happen must be according to God's will. And if you weren't here, I said, that's baloney, right? That, that God does not cause these bad things to happen. God does not cause these hardships to happen. As I was reading and preparing for this uh, sermon this morning, I was reading an, an article on, on, this, on, the, on this topic and this um, woman had replied and wrote in, and she said, look, if I hear one more person that God won't give you anything more than you can handle, I'm going to lose it. I'm going to snap. I'm going to not be Christian-like when they say that to me next time. She says, I've gone through a lot. So I had an abusive husband, right? And you can't tell me that God caused that to happen. My brother committed suicide. I don't want to hear that God, that was God's will that that happened. My, my nephew um, was driving by an IED and, and, and exploded and lost his leg. My best friend has cancer. Don't tell me that's God's will that all these things have happened. Because I'm going to snap if that's the truth. The truth is we will face hardships. And sometimes you're going to feel, and legitimately so, that you are weighed down and you can't handle one more thing. And I want you to hear this morning that they are not a part of God's plan. That is not a part of God's will. It is a part of being human and part of being the human condition. But it is not God's will for your life to put hardship after hardship after hardship on you, right? Jesus experienced this human condition as he came and was fully divine and fully human, right? He suffered, right? He was rejected. He was betrayed. He was tortured, right? But even through that, we see that Jesus and God proclaims that that won't be the end, right? That that worst thing will never be the last thing as we talk about here and there. And so if we don't want to say God won't give you more than you can handle, what are we left to say, right? And maybe sometimes you think about what your mama said. If you have anything good to say, don't say anything at all, right? But here's something good that you can say, right? Instead of God won't give you any more, whatever we're saying, God won't give you more than you can handle. Instead, what if we flip that and begin to tell people God will help you handle all that life has given you? You see the, tur the turn there? God will help you handle all that life has given you. It's not that God gives you the hardships, right? And yes, life is hard sometimes. I'm not going to sit up here and say it's not. Life is hard sometimes, but we profess belief in a God that walks with us, not just when we're holly jolly and skipping on clouds, but even more so when we are in the muck of it, right? We think about Psalm 23 that we often recite, and we say it at, at funerals and through our hard times, right? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. And that is the promise that we cling to in the hardships of life, and we feel like we have experiencing more than we can handle, we, when we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, we are reminded that God is with us every step of the way. I trust that God will be with us and with me as I go through the hard times in life, that he will walk with me, he will support me, and that eventually, even in my most trying times on the other side, there will indeed be light. There will be joy in the morning after a night filled with sorrow. I mentioned that a woman who responded in that article about this same topic and she wrote a, a, the second part of her follow-up. She said, I've, become to, I've got to a place, even though all those bad things happened in my life, that I am rejecting God's will, that this was God's will that happened, right? She says, I began to realize that God has put people in my life to help me cope. That it's never easy. My life has not been easy, but I've never felt alone. I know that God is with me. And when I feel like kicking and screaming and crying, I know that I can turn to God and God can handle that and God will comfort me. She said, God gave me an attorney to eventually divorce my husband and get out of that situation. She helped uh, give a, a voice to others and began to help with suicide prevention so that others and goodness might come from the loss of her brother. 
who said, yes, her nephew lost a leg by the, by the IED, but he's still alive, and we celebrate that we get to have him with us here and today. She said, all these bad things that happen in my life, I can see where God did not cause them, but God is turning and using them for good. And she says, I take comfort in that, that God has helped me handle all that life has given me. I recently read about uh, poet Annie Johnson Flint, who was born in the late 1800s. And Annie was born, her mother died when she was about three years old, right? Um, and then her father continued to raise her, but eventually her father became so ill that he had to give the children up for adoption, and they lost their father. Thankfully, Annie was adopted by this beautiful family, the Flint family, and they, they raised her and loved her and nurtured her. But by the t- before she graduated high school, her adoptive parents also passed away. Can you imagine not just losing one parent, or two parents, but two sets of loving parents, and, and she struggled, and she always wanted to be a teacher, and so she began to continue on in studying in her edu- as, educa- as an educator, and right before she got into her teaching career, was teaching for a year or two, she came down with this degenerative disease and was no longer able to teach, and before long, she found herself um, having to be cared for in a wheelchair, and, and she loved to write poetry and loved to continue teaching, but eventually she couldn't even write, and so she had to get, get people to dictate things to her, and this is uh, one of her more famous poems that she wrote towards the end of her time, with all the hardships that she had come to. And you may have heard this before, it's used a lot in religious circles, but it's called, uh, What God Hath Promised. And here are these words that, that Annie penned, going through all the things that she went through in her life. She says, God hath not promised skies always blue, flower strewn pathways all our lives through. God hath not promised sun without rain, joy without sorrow, peace without pain. But God hath promised strength for the day, Rest for the labor, light for the way, grace for the trials, help from above, unfailing sympathy, and undying love. Our friends, when we are faced with temptation, I hope that you will cling to what we read in 1 Corinthians 10, that there is a way out of this, right? But when you're going through hard times, and you feel like you can't stack one more thing on what you're going to, right? I want you to know it's okay to say, I can't handle this by myself. This is more than I can handle. And to reach out for help, reach out to friends, reach out to a doctor, reach out to a counselor, reach out to this community that gathers here. I know we're separated because we're still trying to, you know, social distance, but we are called to be here for each other. We light the community candle because we are a community together. And when you go through hard things, reach out and find the help that you need. Reach out to the God who promises to be there with us. Trust in God's goodness that God will walk with us, that God will be there, and that God's spirit is at work in us and in our life situations helping us handle all the things that life gives us. I want to close this morning by a prayer that's not my own. It was written by a colleague, but I thought it was very appropriate for today. And so um, I invite you to, to pray with me. Oh God, how grateful we are for the way you walk with us in every moment of our lives. In those moments when we're tempted and tested, help us to remember that we can resist and that you make a way out of temptation. Give us the strength we need when we turn to you. Lead us not into temptation as we would go on our own, but in your path and away from all evil. When we walk through difficulty and adversity, help us remember that these burdens did not come from you, but that you have said you would help us bear them. Thank you for people who come along our path and help carry us through those challenging times. Help us have eyes to see those around us who need your help and to see how we might be instruments of your help for them. How grateful we are, O God, that you are our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even when our whole world seems to be falling apart. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Come now to our time where we collect our tithes and offerings. Um, We do so by bringing them forward, or you can also scan the QR code There's ways to give online or text to give as well. And as we give, we go to support ministries that this church has to help others go through life as they face things that they maybe are too big. We provide ministries to help them out and to teach them and give them the language to do so. And so I invite you to stand as we continue in worship and bring your offerings forward.
Come to our time in our service where we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. And here at uh, Clemson UMC, we practice what's called an open table. Sort of is what it sounds like. It's an open table where we recall that Christ invites to his table all who earnestly seek to repent of their sin, who seek to live in love and peace with one another, who want to know God more. You do not have to be United Methodist. This could be your first time walking into a church, and I want you to know that you are invited here at this table. If you're back in the back corner like I was long ago, you're saying, even me? Yes, even you have a place here at this table. I invite you to follow along on the screen when appropriate as together we celebrate the great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. you. There we go. We lift, Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks and praise to you, God Almighty. You saw fit to create the heavens and the earth and the creatures that inhabit it. Lord, you formed us, humankind. You formed us in your image, and you breathed the breath of life into us. And you called us good. We confess, O God, there are times when we have not gotten it right. There are times when we have not loved you nor our neighbors as we should, and we repent of those sins now. But we give you thanks, O God, that your steadfast love, your open arms, and your grace abounds, welcoming us back time and time again. And for that, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise. We remember when we come to this table, it was you who sent your son, Jesus Christ, down to earth so that he would heal the sick. He would spend time with those on the margins. He would proclaim release to the captives. He would ultimately die on a cross but be resurrected three days later, breaking the chains of sin and death and showing us a life of forgiveness, a life of abundance. And for that, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise. We remember it was on the night in which Jesus was to give himself up for us. He was having a meal with his disciples. And at that meal, he took some bread. He blessed it. He gave thanks to you. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, all of you. This is my body, which will be broken for you. Do this often in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. Once again, he gave thanks to you, God. And he gave it to his disciples who were there. He said, I want you to drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this often in remembrance of me. And so for these, your mighty acts, O God, we give you thanks and praise as we offer ourselves as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ, as together we proclaim the mystery of faith, that Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Lord, we ask that you will pour out your Holy Spirit upon all who are gathered here this morning, both in person and worshiping with us afar. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon this wheat of the field and the fruit of the vine. May they be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world your hands and feet. Lord, make us one with each other. Make us one with you and one in ministry to all the world, O God, that those who feel the burden of life weighing them down, or may we be your instruments of help and love and mercy in their times of need. We ask all these things in the holy and precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray this prayer with confidence. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. When we come and we share in this meal together, 
It's a sharing and a reminder that we are made one in the body of Christ. And when we drink from the cup, it's a reminder that we are a forgiven people. And that God is with us every step of the way and offers us new opportunities day in and day out through God's grace. I invite those who are serving to please come forward, those who are assisting. And if you're new here, we, um, we don't do common cup anymore. If you're wondering why, just think about it. Um, but we, um, we do our, our, our small glasses, but we are still one community. Um, you'll come through. We have our holy sanitizers, uh, Landon and Coleman. You come through, and they will give you a, a dab of, of hand sanitizer. And then you'll come forward, and you'll be given a piece of bread. Remember, we don't snatch grace. We receive God's grace. So come with your hands open and receive the love that Christ has for each and every one of you. And then you'll receive a, a, a cup that we place on the table for you. You consume. Uh, there's baskets, waste baskets you can place your trash in or take them back or take them home, whatever you want to do. But as I mentioned, this is God's table. Each and every one of you are invited here. You have a place here. And so as you feel comfortable, as you feel led, we invite you to come to the table of grace, to come and to experience the God who is with you every step of the way. As you're ready, won't you come?
I invite you all to stand as together we pray our prayer following communion. Gracious God, we thank you for this holy mystery where you have given yourself to us. As we go into the world with your grace and love, help us to be your hands and feet as we share your love with the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Where are you now when darkness seems to win? Where are you now when the world is crumbling? Oh, I, I, I hear you say, I hear you say, look up, child, look up, child. Reminded, right? We went through God won't give you more than you can handle. Push that aside. But be reminded that God will help you handle all that you're going through. And as you go through the hardships of life, be reminded to look up and be reminded that God is with you. But also take a moment to look around you and maybe look in the mirror and realize that you are also God's gift to other people. That we are the help that God is providing to help others go through their hardships. As you leave here, be reminded that God is with you, but also be reminded that God is sending you to be the help to someone who's carrying a heavy burden this week. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.